I am George Knapp listening to that UFO podcast and having one hell of a good time. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and two guests are joining me for this special preview show. Just very quick shout out to listener Tim for the t-shirt that he bought me over a year ago and just wanted to say thank you for that one. So uh, yeah, we do accept free gifts. Um, Dan will tell you as much. Uh, But yeah, joining me for this one uh, is again Dan as a guest this time. Dan, welcome as a guest. A little different. I I wore a different top so I can differentiate between when when I'm, you know, co-hosting and as a guest. Absolutely. And more importantly, uh, Ashley Cowie joining me back on the podcast. Uh, You'll remember Ashley as the director, creator, executive producer, editor, and all things in between of Phenomenology, which is about to hit your on-demand service. Uh, And we're going to talk about that, obviously, today. So, Ash, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again, Dan. Good to see you, too. Okay, that's enough. Uh, Anyway, folks. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, Finally, the day's come. It seems like it's been four months now as we record this since you you were in Colombia, roughly four months. And we recorded back in kind of January, February time, talking about, you know, potentially going. And we'd we, we done some crowdfunding. Dan managed to get the cash to get out to Colombia. It was all quite last minute relatively as well. It wasn't like he yeah. had a, a couple of years or a year to save up for it. It was within weeks. Uh, Dan managed to get himself out to Colombia. So thank you to everyone who helped with that. And yeah, we got to be part of something pretty special. And that something is finally arriving. So available from July 1st. As you listen to this, so July 1st, you might be listening to it on the day on Vimeo On Demand, which we'll we'll come back to. So you've got all the details and links will be in the description. You can watch episode one of Phenomenology titled Dancing Lights. However, it's going to be free for everyone. That's really important to say off the bat. That first episode is going to be free. I've watched it. I've seen a special preview. I'll give my thoughts on that to the gents. I've not told them yet. Um, And I've always said, I'll be honest, so I might slate it, I might be overly praiseworthy, I might be somewhere in between, who knows. Um, But yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about. The cast, it was of course Ashley Cowie, uh, Vinny Adams, you'll know Vinny from Disclosure Team, our own Dan was there, Walter Payne, who is a space analyst, Lydia Romer, an attorney and judge, Uh, Jeshuran Rajashingham, I hope I've got that right, Jesh, uh, who's an analyst, Uh, Natalia Reyes Escobar, a festival uh, artec. Festival Artec, is that right? And Natalia Castellanos, who is a field producer. Uh, That is the cast, and you will meet and see a whole host of others within those episodes as well. Ash, so uh, this has been, what, at least six months much uh, worth of work, as long as I've known you, but I'm sure the planning has gone into it a lot longer than that as well. It's um, quite abstract hearing you describing this. You're the first person that's really described what we've just made. I'm hearing you talking about it with the cast, and it is it's um quite a quite a an intensely anxious moment the day before you publish something like this, but there's a huge amount of satisfaction because I know you watched it and I know Dan watched it, and I'm just sitting here completely um impartial waiting to see what you've got to say about it because. You know, I can tell you all about it. I've already done that, but I would just love to hear what the pair of you thought about episode one. Well, um, episode one is just under the half hour mark, I believe, if I got that right on my timings. Um, We've got a total of seven episodes. Is that going to be correct, Ashley? I believe it was one episode, first one free, then six follow-ups. I was going to email you last night when I sent you the link to the first episode. I should have said to you to always remember that what you're watching is the first of seven episodes. It's not a movie, yeah. so there wasn't a start, a middle, and an end. It's what I call a, it's a slow burn, introducing people to not only the team, but to the environment that we're going to be playing in for the next seven episodes. So, yeah, this free episode, episode one, is um, it features the entirety of the cast, but it's very much an interview-based show so we can set the foundations for what's to come. Yeah, so first thoughts, and it was my first notes. Uh, I'm not going to spoil what's in the episodes, folks. Again, like any documentary, any movie we review, we always encourage you to go and watch it yourself and make up your own mind. There's no excuse not to, especially for the first one when it's free, and Dan's in it as well, so there's always that uh, you know, extra motivation. Um, I've got it like- out for goodness sake, <laughs> <with> mate. <laughs> so I've got it looks very professional. 
Um, the camera work looks very professional. The backdrop is beautiful. And the music is very subtle. Now, I usually, within the first minute of watching anything, and especially UFO documentaries, I can tell how they're going to go, or at least if I'm going to like it or not. And I knew from that point, I don't think I'm going to slate this documentary because there's a lot of things that aren't there that I, that I don't like. And I was happy about that. And I, I've joked in the past, and Dan, you'll know, I've, like I say, I'm going to be honest, that there are things I've watched that I've been like, I hate the music. We, we talked about this, Ash, didn't we, uh, last time mm-hmm. that the some of the documentaries that came out last year with that constant soundtrack all the way through it. But no, subtle music, nice camera work. We've got a team of humans, team of professionals, and we do get right into it. Um, first i did have a question though straight off the bat ash and you've just you've kind of mentioned something there along those lines we do get straight into things and who who are these people and i had to take off my i know some of these folks hat or i remember dan talking to me while he was there and i know ashley if i'm just watching this for the first time it is quite a jump that all of a sudden i'm in with these people that i don't really know is that mm-hmm. something that was deliberate or is that something that will be kind of expanded upon as we go forward sure um, I'm going to answer that directly, but what I don't want to do is miss the bit that you said at the start regarding especially the music. Um, with the documentary, it's audiovisual. Arguably, it's 50-50. The both components have to be balanced and match and tell the same, same story at the same tone. And when we were editing this, every time somebody said something that is inherently dramatic, where most documentary makers would put in those thumping big boom drums and cut it so the person says it four times but we had the composer john theodore and toby mason the the post audio guy do was pull it right back in get just nothing in a lot of occasions or just the most just a remindering rumble or a, something in the back to to accentuate the point that someone's made so i'm delighted you picked up on that there, there, there is no there is a bit of adventure music coming when the guys get into the hills however We'll move forward on to your next question. Remind me specifically, where were we with the second one? You were asking, I was going to answer it direct. I said, I can't even remember the damn question. So getting to know the cast, something I yeah. did notice. And this this was also picked up by, uh, you know, Dan, I think you mentioned when you watched it as well. It was like right into it, you noticed. Uh-huh. And that, that was something I said to Dan. Oh, yeah, I've, I've picked up on that as well quite quickly. So tell us about that. Yeah, so... um. It's funny that you would find that unusual when if you walked into a bar of 12 strangers and you didn't know anything about them, you'd be quite fine navigating yourself through that. So it's called a cold opening, where I have tons of footage that Vinny and Dan filmed of them on planes coming here and and all the rest of it. But here you go. This film, or this series of films, is also designed for the Colombian audience here. It's not just the UFO community that we know. And the person who features in the first in the first episode, who tells lots and lots of stories, to me is equally as important as us, as the researchers who feature, not, feature in all seven episodes. And what you're gonna find, which is a relief for you, is that this, the opening of episode two, it's all about us. It's And it's the team talking about how they felt meeting each other for the first time. So as I say, I'm going to slowly build up the characters and them interacting with each other. And the option was, do I make this all about the people or do I make it all about the phenomenon and Columbia? And I chose the phenomenon and Columbia, knowing that was seven more episodes to, to work into the people. So yeah, I, that, that, that there, those observations you've made, will diffuse and dilute somewhat as you go through the season, as you get to know everybody. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to bring you in in a second, Dan. I'm aware you're just sitting there, so I, I will get to you. Don't worry. Uh, that person you talk about, uh, Ash, was Robert Tovar Gaitan. Exactly. Uh, I believe I've got that right. He's a filmmaker and journalist. And again, folks, he has a big uh, part of that first episode talking about witnesses, different testimony. Um, he talks about the reports and experiences and how important they are within the area. Mm-hmm. Something that this reminded me of, and again, Ash, to, to slowly go into what I thought about it, mm-hmm. I was I was trying to think what type of documentary is this going to be. We've had The Observers from last year, which I wasn't too positive on. We've had A Tear in the Sky, which I wasn't too positive on, Dan was. I, but there were bits and pieces I liked. 
we then had the aerial school documentary which i was far more positive on i get the feeling just from watching that 30 minutes it's more of an aerial phenomenon documentary which obviously was very well received and something that came to mind ash is something you said to us back in those those early interviews so again folks if you're looking for the build up in the background and the context you can go back and check those out i'll put them in the description was you talked about wanting this documentary to be a, as much about UFOs as about the people that were involved in bringing that team together and the people together. And I felt there was going to be a lot of that within it as well. It's it's fully populated by people. And, and, and the whole story comes from people. It's all You'll find that I represent maybe one minute of voiceover in the full first episode. And it's because... There's so much coming from the people in scene. But the reason for that is this. It's called phenomenology, not just because the UFOs, the UFO community is using that word and it's catchy. This was decided two years ago almost, this name. Phenomenology, when it was created as a movement by German philosophers in the 19th century, was not the study of Cartesian objects. It was the study of the structures of consciousness and how people perceive unknown phenomenon. I want you to watch that episode again when we go away and I want you to listen to the last one minute where the five team all talk about their different views on different things. Everybody throughout this show, will, you will see them as a team, but each and every one of them in the sit down interviews will be saying completely contrasting things on the same things that we investigate. And that's where the phenomenology rises from it. It's, it's an, an adventure into how the creative imagine inter the imagination interprets what it sees in the sky and trying to figure out what it is that people are seeing in the sky. Two approaches. Just to add there as well, um, I, I really like, I remember when we were out there, we were talking about uh, phenomenology and the term and what it means. And we were talking about people's experiences of, say, the color red. Andy can see it and interpret danger. I can see it and interpret romance. That's kind of what we mean by phenomenology. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I was, I was going to ask Dan you to come in there anyway to answer Ash's question because he did ask me what we thought about it. So over to you. Sure. Um, I, I won't lie. I was super nervous to watch it. Um, you, you know, I flew out to the other side of the world. You were. I, I gave you the, the gentleman, <laughs> you, you know, I gave Ash kind of carte blanche to, you know, cut me off any way that he wanted. He, he could have put together tracks that maybe say things that I would never say but luckily Ash didn't do that and I actually came away very proud um there were a couple of really interesting synchronicities uh you you might have noticed the maps in the episode look fantastic and actually Ash asked me do you know a map guy and literally the day before someone had messaged me that did maps um so it all kind of came together randomly and it, it looks beautiful um, Dan, I have to quickly interject Dominic Burgess who's got in touch with us shout out to Dom <laughs> that guy is like He's, he, his, he's like a digital cartographer. He sees in longitude and latitude and makes things beautiful that are otherwise mundane. Shout out to Dom. Anyway, it's it's so that. good for context as well to kind of get the lay of the land before we dive into the story. But what I said to Andy and Davini after watching it is that I came away thinking, wow, this doesn't feel like a UFO documentary. This feels like I'm watching David Attenborough tackle the phenomenon. And I was really proud of that. And when the credits rolled, I... You know, if I'd have had episode two there waiting, I would have dived straight in. Let, let, let me mention, okay, so first off on the maps, yes, that was another thing I've got down on the production side of things. It wouldn't look out of place on, on the History Channel alongside a, a Skinwalker Ranch in terms of production. I think if you ran that afterwards or before it, I think you would look at it and go, yep, fair enough. I don't think you would realize it was a smaller crew with you know iphones and drones and that kind of stuff okay so in, in terms of the, the production that's great let me ask though dan on the flip side of what you've said there and ash this, this is for yourself first people are going to look for to this as being a ufo documentary first and foremost who listen to this podcast uh, unless they're really into their nature documentaries <laughs> as well Yes, there's some lovely back, lovely backdrops, and you've got a human element to it. You've got people who are going to watch for Dinny, eh, for Dinny. God, there's a new nickname for Vinny, for Dan. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure yeah. Walter and co have got people who want to watch for them as well. But essentially, you're, you're pitching what is a UFO documentary to folks. In this first episode, there are some images interspliced with, within mm -hmm. the uh, within Robert's testimony and what he's talking about, and as others speak. However... 
people expecting to see loads of videos, loads of like kind of flashing images popping up of really intense pictures. That's not there. It tends to be pictures of a, a light at a distance. And if I showed someone that picture without any context, not being part of a documentary, they would say that is a light on a hill. I get, however, what you've done around that is build context. If anyone watches that, because I know for a fact there's going to be people who would be me included, who wouldn't have any background, I would see that and go, oh, there's no UFOs in this. What would you say to those people who maybe watch the first one and think, I don't know how much more of it I do want to see? Okay, great. The first thing I would say is, put beside mine the any TV show or any film that has actually showed a UFO. Let's be clear here. Not one single photograph or video exists of an identifiable object in the sky today. Otherwise, we would not have a community. It doesn't exist. What I'm not going to try and do is pretend that I have that. What I have, as you're going to see, are scores and scores of people who have all reported what you just said. Lights on a mountain for 400 years. Of course, Mick West is going to, before the episode's finished, there will be a screenshot on Twitter saying, these are torches on the mountains. What we've published in that film are the images that people are taking and the accounts that people have made for 400 years. So if you're expecting to come on and see, in the first episode, an image of a, flat, of a hubcap designed by Chaucer, it ain't happening. It's not about that, but we do present and let me get this right so it's absolutely as safe as I said to the guys it would be. We promise to present by the end of this season or series of seven films anomalous lights that will set on fire the UFO community, both skeptical and believers. That is a promise. But not an episode one. Am I going to start putting in cheap videos from other people that are quite clearly mylar balloons? Just like everywhere else in the world where there's UFOs reported, there are a lot of misinterpretations, a lot of pilot misinterpretations from the highest level in order here in Colombia, just like the Chilean UFO event. The highest levels of authority approved a UFO and it was out in the, the, the community space for less than four days and it was solved. I'm not starting to use all the old videos that exist here, the newspaper cuttings of things that nobody knows. We've got a team of humans exploring the valley of the gods in which a 400-year-old light phenomenon exists. Before we get to the end of episode three, the guys are going up a hill. I mean, I just wish I could tell you what we're investigating. We do present videos. We do present things like that. But it just ain't happening in season one, episode one. And I also don't want to make the show succeed or fail on my pre-publishing claims of it's going to be groundbreaking stuff and all this hype that just is but the hype in the UFO community is essentially a six inch nail in one's own coffin you don't get away for it with hype and I've been trying to be so so restricted and reserved in regards to what we're going to show and that's why I'm leaning on the people the culture the story the country the you called it a sort of David Attenborough well it kind of I hope it is because I've got seven episodes to try and tell a story and what, what I do want the audience to come away with more than a picture of a silver object in the sky that's a bit blurry is a really good understanding of where we are. This thing, you, the, the analogy you said, like it's like a history show, uh, Skinwalker Ranch episode is deliberate because, I, you know, if I say to you Skinwalker Ranch and then say close your eyes and picture the mesa you can do it in a heartbeat from the back and the front door of the ranch. Why? Because the graphical information and their drone work and their setting off the scene is so well. Well, I want to do that too. So you watched episode one, which shows some photographs of lights on hills, which can be argued about, but you know, you know, there's not much talking about those lights yet. We, we don't do that till we actually get to the tops of those mountains. And we do, we get to them and we explore them and we, 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 we do some phenomenology. So I think I've probably spoken long enough about whatever the original question was. 
and listen, in all fairness, that that is what worked for the aerial phenomenon documentary because that mm. didn't show you any new footage. It was no. largely archival footage mixed in with the the human story from Emily Trim and some of the other witnesses as they've grown up, and it was just a lot of older material presented in a very clear, concise, and new way. Again, yeah. we we saw the the drawings from the children. We heard the testimony, and largely it was that the testimony and the human element that that drove that success on when other mm. documentaries since the phenomenon have shown a lot more footage, a lot more pictures, like you say, and to what end? Because no documentary uh, and no TV show, and I include Skinwalker Ranch in that, is going mm. to be the one that gives us that bang disclosure because that's not going to happen after three months of recording, sitting in a, an editing that's room right. floor, and then you know, you're know you going to see it this Tuesday between 7 and 8 p.m. Eastern. That's not going to happen. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that there's no reason to say that success now has to be done because documentaries like Aerial Phenomenon have shown the success yeah. can be there in the format and the storytelling and the narrative. Yeah, I, I just want to I, emphasize as well that we're not comparing to Skinwalker in a way that it treats the audience as dumb. What what I liked is that Ash respects the audience. We don't get these repeats of the same points over and over again. There are no ad breaks. You know, you're not going to be reintroduced to things 10 times in the episode. Um, what you're going to see is a team of people with different ideas about what that light or what those lights on the hill is doing a live investigation in a live laboratory. When, when we were out there, I said to Ash, it kind of felt like a UFO theme park, like, a, you know, if Jurassic Park was built with UFOs instead, because mm-hmm. everyone had a story and there were so many different kind of interpretations of those. And we all had to try and come together to actually kind of get to a result and something, you, you know, I wanted to come back and be able to say we've actually progressed this investigation. And, yeah. and I absolutely feel that by the end of it, we do. Yeah. And also, Andy, it, you know, it's actually quite a stiff question to answer because you know, I, I could put it back in you and say, the only person that's seeing this as a UFO film is yourself. Well, obviously, I'm on a UFO channel. You're a UFO guy. We're all UFO people. We are all interested in what's in the sky. But it is called phenomenology. And the reason I'm doing this and I've come into this world is because I saw that this new term UAP was a wonderful way for me to, to come from making archaeology and history shows into a world that's usually been associated with, you know, the sort of the fringe community. Now it's a safe thing to look at, and phenomenology is much, much bigger than UFOs because in the valley here, there's been these lights have been associated with the spirits of saints, with Mohana and Mohana, indigenous gods and goddesses. This the 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 breadth of phenomenology here is what the film's trying to show because I hope it's going to appeal to people out with the UFO community that we're going to see this UAP in Colombia. What might this be? And what they're not seeing is a bunch of blurry photographs. They're seeing sharp photographs when they're shown photographs, and they're seeing a bunch of just normal, down-to-earth folk struggling with what's been struggled about for 400 years. So it shows a sort of... What Skinwalker does is show the the top of the iceberg in their half-hour episode or their hour episode, and lots and lots of reviewers, I'm sure you've heard it, I've heard it, they're all annoyed that... There's not enough shown about what goes on there. They're not showing the science behind what's shown. We're doing the opposite. We're showing what actually happens when a bunch of folks get together. I've got a picture of Walter cleaning his toenails, which I'm deciding to use or not, in his bedroom when his drone's charging. (laughs) We're going to show the the gritty cinema verity stuff that happened in front of me when those people were here for a week. It's more about what happened when we went investigating Un- unidentified phenomenon in Colombia. So yeah, it's much broader than UFOs. However, it absolutely revolves around classic UFOs, unidentified flying objects. I must bring up that quote that appeared in the first episode from Ermin Repuesta, who is the ex-director of the Bogota Observatory. He, he, he is convinced that there is a phenomenon in this valley. And the people in Colombia, you've got this really a, a, pretend, a, a predisposition for people to believe in UFOs, like an enormous, I think it's 64% of North Americans believe, but over, over 80% here do. So the story is also being translated into Spanish, and it's trying to tell a, a story to Colombians about the history of their phenomenon from a gringo. It's quite dangerous, quite sensitive. So I've had to do that really respectfully. And it is therefore no accident that I used Roberto 
willingly and openly and unashamedly in the first episode to nail it into Colombian viewers' seats and also to bring it into the rest of the world too. But um, UFOs come, Andy. UFOs come. <laughs> they the, do. the nature UFO thing for me is, is an interesting one because people are going to take it in different ways. Mm-hmm. And what, what I'm trying to say by that is that eventually UFOs aren't going to be called UFOs. They're going to have a name. And when that happens, ufology is going to die. And I, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean that it's going to grow up. It's going to start going into the areas that it should have always been. These things go. are a fact of nature. They just are. So treating it like a nature documentary, I feel like it's kind of a, a maturing of the subject. You've got it. And you're going to learn all about the pre-Columbian Moisca culture here. We're not, I mean, my goodness, they call it Skinwalker Ranch. We heard it in the first episode, but we're not hearing so much of the indigenous skinwalker that's actually in the title of that show anymore. We do, we go to, let me, yeah, I can tell you, episode three has us going to a, an indigenous community on a hilltop, and we we don't only help them, I'm not going to tell you what we do, but we, we help them, we, we give a day of our time to the community, and then we interview the leader of an indigenous community about the traditions and UFO sightings that they've had for the last several thousand years. So we we don't just use, we don't skirt over this this story here. There is a real cultural story that the lights are threaded to and rooted to. And that's why I've introduced the gods and the goddesses in this first episode, because they come right back around and into this whole thing. But Dan, maturity in the UFO community, how about this? It exists here because, listen to this, so in the Western world, it's either a UFO or it isn't. Here, as you're going to see in the documentary, is two people in Tenho make the sighting of the same object in 1979, and their argument is whether it's the El Encanto or the Mohana. They have specific categories for the aerial phenomenon here. For example, the Mohana is a red, bulbous ball of light, Whereas the, whereas the El Encanto is a white tic tac oblong golden light, and people, so it, it's exceptionally categorised here and has been for decades, if not centuries. So that's a really good thing for me. We get to virtually in every episode pick a new angle on this phenomenon and what it might do. I hope it does is it'll give people lots of other lots of new openings and ways to think about the phenomenon in their own countries and what they might be. What you'll love in this is Walter, he's not sceptic. Yes, he is, isn't he? Walter's really sceptic. But we've got sceptics in the team and we've got those that are prone to believe. And that's what I love most about the editing. I'm just shocked sometimes at how we come away from a location and I'll have a chat with Dan and he'll say this. I'll have a chat with Walter and he'll say this. And they're so opposing. But then you see them having a high five and breakfast together the next day, laughing at their differences and eye to eye challenging. Sometimes it gets a bit tense because you're like, hang on, I know he really believes that because he told it to me in an interview and I know he just shit all over it. <laughs> and, and that goes on too. So we try to tell that story of what people experienced while researching the unidentified phenomenon of the Valley of the Gods. Let me ask Dan, um, there's a moment you and Vinny in episode one and I'm aware i know you've got an academic background in this dan and ashley it goes without saying you're experienced in tv shows and making and everything else given what you've just done and your history but i i get that just because you see something in the first episode doesn't mean it was the first thing that was filmed there's a moment you and Vinny yeah. in the first episode dan say there, there's clearly something here and i think Vinny, word for word in one of the the clips talking head towards the end is like yes 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 i'm a believer i'm all in and i think that's just Vinny anyway he's very open to accept like you know the, the, the phenomenon or he really wants it to be like a ufo or something like that when he sees something which many of us do but what what gave you that impression dan so early on and when it was filmed that there was something there mm. was it the meeting with robert is that just the way it's edited or did you have that feeling from the start regardless well the meeting with robert actually came quite late in in our visit out there um so it's just the way that ash has chosen to tell the story yeah. um yeah the in terms of how long it took me to realize there was something out there driving through just the local town uh tabio blew my mind over here if you had say ufo graffiti on the wall it would be this overly dramatic stuff 
um you know little green men that kind of stuff whereas the town was plastered in this beautiful graffiti yeah. and you need only take 10 seconds to have a look and you would see all these subtle references to uap and to you know the the holy dove or you know mary magdalene kind of coming down and yeah as we were walking past one of the gates we stopped to a, a gentleman had a he'd written his story out and put it on the front of his gate and we were having it translated and the guy actually came out and spoke to us about what he saw and that kept happening over and over and over again yeah. so it was very clear that people were seeing something i've got to answer a technical i'm going to give you a technical a, a sort of addition to what dan said there the, the absolute truth is there's nothing to hide here is i spent eight weeks editing an episode one and in, in which on the first day i stood up in this room that we had and I told them the stories of the valley. I told them about the goddess Chi. I told them about the captain seeing the oblong going round her farm. I told, we did all this for me. And I'll, this is what happened. I watched Caroline Corey's interview on um, one of the American podcasts. And I realized that having me in the, as, like speaking for 20 minutes in the first episode was a big, big mistake. Although, I only had one option otherwise, and that was to go and use the interview with Roberto that we did, you know, five or six days into the trip. So I used that at the beginning because I would much rather have the stories of the valley and the basics coming from a Colombian rather than me. Because all that review, all we would be talking about just now is you would be finding it hard not to say, well, Ash, you know, you featured quite heavily in episode one, didn't you? So uh, rather than that, I put Roberto in and pulled myself right out of it. And it was after Carl and Corey interview when I just heard how much um, that filmmaker had pushed herself into the actual thing. And I can't have it be about the director. It's a far bigger, bigger story than what I'm, what any part I've got to do with it. So that was really what happened. We, I, but here's another example. So we, at the beginning of that day, oh no, it's actually episode two, you know, we go up Waika, we get a drone in there, we do the foothills of the two places, the two main mountains. And like, do you remember this, Dan? We were coming down the hill and the policeman said to me, what is it you're actually all doing with your drones and cameras? And I said, well, we're trying to film the mysterious lights of La Peña de Waika. And he laughed at me and I was like, well, what's going on here? He laughed and he said, it's not lights, it's UFOs. He said, the lights are blue and red and go around the mountain, but the UFOs are white and they zip into space. I'm like, oh, well, I am so sorry, you know, so we're, we're filming the UFOs. <laughs> That's how ingrained it is. So day five, Dan and Vinny are in the back of a van. But what I did there was I used that clip in the first place. However, while I'm sort of doing that to tell the story best, what you'll notice has never been done is there's never... There's never, you don't hear anybody's voice being chopped or things, them, you know, things being juggled around like that. What we've done is we pulled an, an interview in that we did later in the trip into the first. So it's really interesting that you picked up on that. Why would Dan and Vinny be so heartfully convinced there's something going on? I suppose the answer to that is because they've just met Roberto and heard about 20 different types of phenomenon. You know, I suppose that's the takeaway. Just to mention, Ash, I absolutely would have pulled you up if you had put yourself into 20 minutes of that first episode for, for <laughs> doing that and divulging yourself. Um, well, that... How about this? How about you're going to maybe hate this, but I thought I would, I'm going to do this because it's the, on, it's the truth. Once the season's out, I'm going to publish extra videos and cuts and behind-the-scenes stuff, and I thought I would publish the alternative episode one that wasn't published and say on it, and here's the reason why, but... Listen to my take on the stories, because I tell the stories. Lovely. It's just the fact that it is me and my voice, and it's all gringo in the first episode of a Colombian documentary. I thought, how much more tasteful to pop in a 70-year-old phenomenologist who's has he's on all the news and the TV stations. It's going to help people here relate to the show. So that was the decision. It was me out and him in. You you keep saying gringo as well. I, I just want to put out there that a shaman blessed me as Ringo by the time I left Colombia. So so Ringo. I shifted. Ah, Ringo star, brilliant. Uh, it wasn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. Remember that, folks. <laughs> um, listen, Dan, something that I uh, enjoyed in the first episode, including that quick pace. There's another thing I did enjoy about it. The half hour goes by very quickly, folks. Um, was when we see Walter with the drone. 
and he's clearly enjoys his technology. He had the uh, it's a quite a quick shot, but you're all around the the iPhone attached to the drone. I'm going to say it's an iPhone. Other phones uh-huh. are available, um, and that's something that a lot of people are crying out for within documentaries. One thing that was done well in a Terror in the Sky was the the science aspect of it and the actual investigations that the UAPX. Oh, tried to do and that's what was successful not the other stuff that people didn't like so to see that there's going to be some technology again used within this and i'll put this to dan first what other tech can we expect to see or or how is that technology going to be used throughout so that technology was i mean i'll talk about the drone specifically because we actually used the drone in one instance to and there might be some debate about this with witnesses but i feel like we solved the case uh, but it's a real good example of us basically going, you know what, the, the science here, you know, we've sat down, we've worked out all the angles of where you said you saw this thing and so on and so forth. And we're using the drone to kind of fly in the direction you said it was. And I, I feel like we, like I said, we, we figured it out despite the, the witnesses not necessarily agreeing and having their own preconceived notions about it. So it, it, it could get a little uncomfortable in feeding back to people. But like Ash said, we're, we're there to tell the truth not to kind of pull walls over yeah. someone's eyes it's easy to you know do a cg ufo and have it fly through the valley but that's just not what we're doing no in in terms of other technology there was there was actually a cool bit in episode one where we were using a, a lidar on the iphone to create a 3d model of a uh, ash you might want to explain this of chia if i remember correctly uh a, the a moon statue goddess? that moon that's God. right that walter yeah. found on a dig right. do, do you want to explain that sure chia the goddess of the moon is known as the Mohana, and the Mohana are red lights. So the Chia, the moon goddess, is integrally connected with the entire story of the phenomenon in the valley. Walter, who you saw in episode one, he was down here four years ago, and I took him to an area very close to that church because I suspected there was an indigenous temple of the moon there. And sure as fate, Walter discovered this 32-gram Tumbaga gold figurine of Chia herself which I couldn't tell, I couldn't go to the lengths of it in the first episode, but it's the only physical representation of that goddess that exists. Every other representation of the goddess is stars with 13 representing the lunar month. So the, what, what we did was, we, we, yes, yeah, so Walter creates his figurine. That was just a sort of cutaway clip, but then he does this orthostatic mapping of the church. Now you'll see by the end of episode seven, one of the things our team achieved while they don't know it yet is we mapped, drone mapped, all of the sites associated with the light phenomenon. So we now at the end are gonna present this in uh, Project Waika, the greater project about the phenomenon here. You know, mapping from the valley with high resolution drones so if people do get sightings, we can start actually locating them on a map and building up a, a valley-wide map of what people see and where. Because what I'm convinced of is that some of these phenomena are, are climatological, absolutely convinced, like in the Histalin Valley. But it's only by monitoring these sightings over the course of the years and marking the dates and the times and the temperatures and then marrying it with mapping information that we can start to get a full picture. So while I never thought about it, in the first episode we do, we use a 3D scanning app. We use a drone that's mapping the the church that's associated with the UAP. And then as we get further into the the episode the drones used again as Dan says we get we get presented with an exceptionally alluring high definition sharp film of a light phenomenon don't we Dan in episode four and we go investigate yeah. it we interview six or seven people that were all eyewitnesses to this occurrence and it was by map again mapping exactly where the eyewitnesses claimed they saw it that we were able to go to an exact spot in rural Colombia and let's just say we were able to, as Dan said, we were just it was just the biggest nailed it moment. That's what it was. A real the boys that are out here looking for the funny things in the skies just put our entire family and group of eyewitnesses at ease because we nailed what they filmed and what it potentially is. However there's an ongoing debate about our conclusion on that. So it's what's refreshing is we've got lots of things that we investigate and provide answers to that. They aren't just 
as Dan says in one of the clips, it's not just an easy option, it's ET. There's lots and lots more going on here that gets thought about. And and um, we were able to, 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 to really distill down a lot of classic cases. And, and um, as I said, most importantly, I've not hyped, so I'm allowed to say is that the, the, episode, the series is not shy of goodies for the UFO community, is it, Dan, by the time it's done? No, not at all. Um, some some people listening to the podcast will know I have a, a kind of liking for the electromagnetic ideas, and wow. we do apply those kind of maps that that uh, places like NASA have taken uh, to some of these sightings and, and come up with some really interesting ideas around it as well, which I thought was pretty cool. You, you know, you go back 20 years and you can't download an electromagnetic map that's current and apply it to your investigation, whereas mm -hmm. we could fairly easily. Yeah, it's like for 400 years, that is one of the most magnetically charged valleys in Colombia. It's incredible, the natural light phenomenon that goes on here. And one of the, the great things, just in the back of a van, Dan was chatting about overlaying a magnetic map in the valley. And he was able to discern with Walter that one mountain has a positive, is in a positively charged area and the other is in a negatively charged area. And you know what's really good with that is they downloaded uh, an application, put it over Google Maps, and worked all this out. But you know, Andy, for sixty years, people in the UFO community have a tendency to say to use sloppy words like energy. Oh, there was a, an energy or things like that. But what we did was we were able to say, no, hang on, there is actually a magnetic disposition in the valley here that, that could act like two anodes on a battery, and there could be some form of light charge between so so that's an interesting that comes in about episode four or five when we when we get deeper into it and when we actually go to the sites what I'd like it to is do... it's going to read out as an adventure it's the more it, the more it unfolds the more adventurous it becomes and it's not falsely adventurous and again there's no indiana jones music it's really trippy you know it's that guy john theodore is doing this beautiful piano and stuff instead of the doom, 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 it's none of that it's really thought provoking. I want people to be able to watch it on a Sunday and not be offended. I want it to be welcome in people's homes and not be the, just this erratic, bombastic, knockabout, sloppy, general thing that's associated with UFO films. You know what it's like. There's a lot of disrespect going on just now to the UFO community by UFO producers. That's a fact. What I want to do is in a month or so, once it's been out and it's had time to breathe, is get you back on and talk about it more openly once people have seen the episodes and the contents out there and we can dissect it a little bit more granularly. Granularly, that's the word. Um, which would be good, yeah. Very difficult for me to say. Um, what I want to know, though, is, and what the listeners will obviously want to know, they can watch the first episode for free. Um, you've decided for Vimeo On Demand, and this is something that's come up more and more as people get to know the the process that directors like James Fox has to go through just to get something out there. It's not as easy as, oh, get it on Netflix. And it's like, well, yeah, that's that's that would be great, but that's not really an option for everyone. Um, we heard that from Randall Nickerson on the Aerial Phenomenon documentary, how he had several different issues with suppliers and getting it out yep. there and his thought process. What did you decide on in terms of price? What are people going to have to pay for it? And obviously they can't buy it. Is that correct that they have to rent it? Yeah. Um, right. First things first. I'm almost 50. I've been doing making TV shows for other people and getting paid sometimes crumbs for a lot of work for a lot of years. And this the reason Vimeo is there is because I decided this isn't a network show. I'm not going to waste my time for three years trying to sell it to some network exec in Netflix that gets sacked. Someone else comes in and I never get called again. I thought, no, let's do this ourselves. Let's make this something that we can get Dan and Vinny and the guys out every year and film another season and make it sustainable. And Vimeo was a really good option to do that because it helps people like me who are trying to do all the jobs from filming it, writing it, to editing it. If you do upload something, you can make an edit, make a change and re-upload it. So you have quite a lot of creative control with Vimeo. Um, pricing wise, my good Lord, Dan, what did we, what was the, what's the pricing? What's it available for? It's, do you remember what I said? An episode? Was that five or six hundred an episode? <laughs> and you get the Dan, the, the bathroom shots. With Dan I'll, I'll come cook for you and stuff as well. <laughs> Good God. I think it comes to, I, I need to check this, but I, I believe it's um, $19.99 for the seven episodes. And if it isn't, it's got to be now, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> so 90, but we are going to also offer, people can watch it. That's what it totals to if you watch it episode by episode. I think it's like 2 99 or 3 40 per episode. But there's going to be a package there for people and it's going to be 16 99 They get the whole thing. They can watch the whole episode. And we might even have a membership thing there where you can buy it and join it for a year and then I'm going to do some maybe live updates, post some more footage, behind the scenes stuff. But, you know... Um, I know you always use that when I say it's less than a price of coffee. And I get that. I, I, I get that. But I live in Colombia and you can get coffee for like 15 pence. So I need more than a cup of coffee. But it's um, it's no more expensive, and no less expensive than everything else that's out there on the market. It's just a lot more accessible. And people can, they rent the episodes. And the reason I'm doing that is if you sell it and let people download it your options for doing things with it in the future if selling it making it bigger bringing in another production company they're all restricted if everybody's out there with a copy on their computer so it has to be rented for a time period but um, as i say there people can people can maybe take this membership and they can watch it infinitely for a year and join the actual phenomenology thing so all that'll be explained on vimeo tomorrow but you're not going to be spending over 20 dollars to watch the season Okay. And one thing I know that's been very popular is a question for other documentary makers. You mentioned the bonus footage and, and if someone chooses yeah. to rent it or get that membership, all that would come at the inclusive cost. Is that what you're thinking just now? Yeah, I'm gonna we've got I've just got so, so much stuff that we that's been mastered and there's music there and the voices have been balanced and it looks beautiful, but it just can't make the final episodes but i'm not i'm not restricted by netflix who have this chance to put out seven episodes and that's it done that's not going in my this editing bin they talk about that's going public so i'm going to offer something which is going to be almost within the course of the year you're going to be getting as much content extras behind the scenes interviews you know because i have interviewed dan and Vinny for hours and hours when we were out there up in rooms I always remember what you said, Andy. Um, you you had a problem with, I believe it was P. I had already done it by this, but then you said you didn't like the fact on the Tear in the Sky documentary they were in California. They're in the they're on the beach, but they, they've got fake backgrounds. And you said your words were about three months ago. Why can't they just have sat someone in front of a window with a nice background and just interviewed them and make it about the people? So I did that for hours, fortunately, with our guys, and you know. Who has Dan or Vinny being interviewed for an hour? I've got that. So that's going to be really good for the UFO community, hearing what those two guys and the other people in the show actually think when they're pressed. And some of the stuff is quite pressed. And you heard why I asked Vinny. I'm asking him if he thinks he's deluded. Is it an illusion? You really believe this? You know, I give the guys a bit of a pressing from time to time. So it's good. I want people to see that. They can answer questions when getting knuckled down and it's not just, it's very easy to interview people. You, you're in full control, but the guys put themselves out and vulnerable with me. We came brothers pretty quickly and I know the guys' secrets and I've got them on film and I think that should all come out as well because it was part of our phenomenology experience. So by tomorrow, there's going to be a very clear thing on Vimeo, which will be at here. Pay this for a year. You can watch the films as much as you want for a year and you get all this stuff extra. And that's going to cost, you know, somewhere like $5 more than it will be to watch the whole thing. So I'm trying to encourage people to do that, to to come in and, to, you know, to join the movement, if you like. Because season two is coming quite soon. Well, uh, season two is probably a good one to talk about when we come back. Uh-huh. to talk about the full documentary and we can discuss the details obviously of the first season um before i come back to wrap up with you ash dan a couple of words to sum up the kind of experience then without giving anything away for you now that you've kind of been back a few months as well it was an incredibly humbling experience to go out and meet so many people who have encountered this phenomena and had different interpretations of it it really changed me i think and brought me into myself more um and i've had a lot of people say that since i've got back too Mm. so it was incredible truly once in a lifetime experience and i can't wait for people to see what we got up to and ash i'll I'll hand over to you a few words what can people expect tomorrow they go into vimeo on demand or july 1st vimeo on demand phenomenology they click the link in the description to this show 
and they're going to give over their cash, what are they going to be getting in return? Newfound respect from a new UFO producer. A guy making a film, films that you can watch, and not at one minute are you going to be picking your skin or asking yourself, how can they come to that conclusion? How can they say that? That's not based on what we're doing is laying out, telling a story. They're going to get one of the best stories told in the UFO community because it's entirely, in its entirety, original, if it's nothing else. What you're going to get is a, an original story about aerial phenomenon unidentified for 400 years that's not been told before. So, so that's what you're getting, a brand new UAP UFO story. So that's from July 1st on Vimeo On Demand. You can get Phenomenology. Episode 1 is free, remember, titled Dancing Lights. And then pick up the rest of those episodes for the price Ash said, run about sixteen ninety nine or nineteen ninety nine. Sorry for the folks who don't have dollars. You can work those out yourself. But again, you'll get all that extra content and stuff as well as and when it comes out. And I'll get Ash and Dan back on and maybe some of the other cast in a month or so once it's had time to breathe, once those episodes are out, once more folk have seen it and we can discuss it. Ash, I think you want to come back in. Yeah, I just thought of something. I'm sitting here because you're on the podcast and somebody asked me the most essential question, which is how much is your documentary? Do you know something? I just realised there, I think that just about shows you everything in this film where I myself do not know what the cost is. It is the last thing this is about. And I'm not going to say we're doing it for nothing. Of course, we've got a lot of money to try and make back. But it's just so much broader than, you know, than the usual UFO film or show, which has to be and is all about how much it makes. This is a story for the story's sake. You know that, Dan. This was the most grassroots film that I've ever made that you've probably ever been involved in. I know you've been involved in TV and stuff before, but it's like just so real compared to the other ones that are out there for the dollars. And as you said yourself, which I'm amazed and delighted about, is that you know, that, that you're saying the quality maybe even comes close to something that's getting a million dollars an episode budget by History Channel. That is great. So you've told people what they're getting, which is a quality show. And I'm telling them it's an absolutely new and original story. It's like Columbia's Roswell, you know? It's something that's so ingrained here in the, in, in the, in the, the culture, but... Nobody's heard about these dancing lights yet. Please check it out, folks, and let us all know what you think. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet, and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more ass. Meditative game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. And I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should take care of me. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. Consider your heart, consider time, consider your space.
Thank you.